All right, everyone. Well, good morning, and welcome to our uh, next session here at the Revelation of Whom seminar. Uh, just in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and do an opening prayer and turn the time over to, to Lee here. So let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Sabbath. Lord, now as we begin this session, we ask that your spirit may be here with us and bless our speaker this morning, and that it may be uplifting and glorifying to your name. We thank you and ask all this in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, this morning, because we're starting later, I'm going to omit the theme song, and we're going to go straight to the feature with Margie and the kids. So kids, come on, sit on the front row right there. And you're going to like this. This is really cool. And the grown-up kids will be impressed as well, I think. Yeah. I have a little picture here. Huh? No, you do. I just do this. Yeah, right there. Okay. Are right, you ready? Testing test, one, two, three. Test, there test, you there are. Go. Good. Right. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everybody. <laughs> All right. Do you like color, or do you like things more like this? I like color. I like color, too. See, I'm wearing some color here, and you're wearing some pretty colors, too. Did you know that if you take these three colors, we call them primary colors, if you mix them all together, you can come up with all the colors of the rainbow and more. All kinds of beautiful colors, a little bit of each. And I used to do that with my students in school, so it's really exciting. But, you know, we've been talking about a friendship with Jesus and how you get close to him as a friend. And we talked about having a friendship with Jesus stool that has three legs on it, okay? And the first leg we think is an important thing in getting close to Jesus is reading out of the Bible stories every day. They're God's love letters to us. And so that's an important book for us. And if you can't read yet, then who can help us? Mom and dad. Mom and dad or even sometimes grandparents or aunts and uncles. So read a little about Jesus and think about him and his love for us and the story we read. And then the second leg is prayer. We like to talk to him in prayer. Just the way you would talk to a friend. Do you have a hard time talking to friends? Some. All right. So I don't have a hard time talking to friends because I know my friends like me and they like to talk with me. And that's the way it is with Jesus. You talk to him about the things that are important to you. And do you know what? There's different ways we can listen to him talk back to us, too. And that's really cool. Through nature, through reading his Bible, through godly friends talking to us, too. We can hear the voice of God talk to us. So, And then the third leg of the friendship with Jesus stool is sharing or spilling over with people that we meet about how cool our friend Jesus is. Those are the three things that we can do to get closer and closer to him every day. And that's a really neat thing. Oh, I have this black bag here. I call it a holy bag because it has a hole there. And it's not like God holy. And then it has a hole there too. So it's my holy bag. But if we were to take one of these... Right? Don't I put that in? Well. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, um, for many people, when they think about reading the Bible, they think, uh, that's not very exciting to me. I don't know about that book. It's kind of dull and boring to me. Kind of like this this has no color. That's the way it is to them. This one. And But you know what? If they'll pray before they start and they'll just get into some of the, like, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, before they know it, when they're reading their Bible, it will be 
bright and exciting. Yeah, it will be a neat experience for them. We usually have a, a pole that <laughs> you can put the stuff on, but this isn't the same as what it usually is. Okay, and then the second leg of the stool was prayer. Remember prayer? And some people, some people think that prayer is just bother. I'm too busy with life. I don't have enough time to talk to God. Well, guess what? God's the coolest friend you can talk to. We don't want to skip time with talking to God because if we take time to talk to God or Jesus, we will find out that it will be, because we're talking to the king of the universe, it will be a royal experience. Isn't that neat? Not a blah thing like this, but a royal experience. Wonderful. And you'll just love it more and more. The more you talk to him in the prayer, the more you'll want to turn to him about everything. Just like this morning, my daughter had a, her pipes were freezing at her house. And I just felt like right away I wanted to give that to my friend Jesus in prayer so that hopefully we can get that fixed and she won't have a problem with her water. Anyway, okay, and the last third leg of the stool is sharing. And some people, you may be like I was when I was younger, kind of bashful and I'm not sure about talking to other people. But if you tell Jesus, Jesus, I want to be brave for you. May your Holy Spirit make me brave. Then do you know what? He loves to answer that prayer. And he makes it like a fire of color. When you share his love with other people, it becomes like a royal, royal fire. And that all keeps you closer to your best friend Jesus. All of doing those things every day, you get closer and closer to Jesus. And we have found as we're traveling around, going to see people at different churches, that more and more people are getting excited about this friendship with Jesus. They are learning how they can be close to their friend Jesus and they're doing those three legs of the stool and loving Jesus more and more. And as we've found that to be true in some places, we find it to be true more and more in all kinds of places. And you know what? We're, we're looking forward to seeing everybody get so excited about this that this whole world will become like a wonderful wreath of color for people making time to be friends with Jesus. And then Jesus will be so happy that he'll come back and get us and we can all be in heaven together in this wonderful, wonderful circle of godly friends. And I want you to be a part of it. And I want you to be a part of it. <laughs> and all of you to be a part of it too. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you really love us and you are looking for special, special friendship with each one of us. I am so, so thankful. When I grew up, I didn't hear about it this way. And now I'm learning about Jesus as my friend and I'm so glad because that's the best thing I could ever learn. It's the best thing that any of these wonderful friends of yours can learn too. And I pray that every day we we'll want to get with you and stay with you so that we can all be a part of this wonderful circle of godly friends of yours and spend eternity together in heaven. Please make that happen with each one of us. We love you, Jesus. Amen. All right. Thanks, guys. Have you ever seen that photograph? I mean, that painting? It's, it's in the Smithsonian Institute, and it's been all around all other places, too. Uh, it's, the, it's known as George Washington Crossing the Delaware. I'm absolutely certain 
that he was not standing there nobly with his foot on the front of the boat as it was navigating the rapids, the current, and all of the icebergs floating through. Uh, That would have been a recipe for disaster, but it sure makes a good photograph or a good painting. Um, Anyway, the story about that, in 1776, things were looking very bad for the American Revolution. If you studied your history, you know about this. And the army, the American army, was very demoralized. They were depressed. They had a huge defeat at New York, and they were all waiting to quit. When I say waiting to quit, it's because they were all hired soldiers. They're called mercenary soldiers, and their term for work as a soldier was expiring at the end of the year, and they couldn't wait to quit. It wasn't a, they wished they hadn't signed on. They were under-equipped. They were poorly dressed. They were discouraged with the losses that they'd experienced, and they hadn't been, you know, it had just not been a good thing. Many of them were barefoot. They were impoverished. Their meals were scanty. Their clothing was thin. It was cold. It was winter. It was in December, and there was 2,500 soldiers waiting to quit. Then on Christmas Day, George Washington thought, you know what? <clears throat> if we attack the enemy on Christmas, they won't be expecting attack because Christmas Day is the day that people celebrate, so let's sneak across. So uh, on, on Christmas Eve, they began crossing the Delaware. It was 11 p.m. when he started transporting his army across the, the river uh, in the cold and the snow. Oh, and it was snowing, but it was worse than snow. It was sleeting. Sleet, of course, is worse than snow because sleet is kind of rain and ice mixed together. So first it drenches you and then it freezes you. And the army was just miserable. They were shaking and cold. They were transported across, took them from 11 p.m. on Christmas Eve until 3 a.m. in the morning, four hours to get the army across the river. When they got to the other side, they pressed on through the cold and dark, heading for a surprise attack. And historians tell us that they left a trail of red in the snow because the cracked and bleeding bare feet of many of the army was was tracking blood in the snow. So it was a miserable thing, but they surprised the Hessian soldiers in outposts at Trenton and Princeton. And because they surprised them, they ended up being victorious. And because they won, all of a sudden, it was a turning point. The soldiers were excited. They'd finally won two battles. And uh, a whole slew, overnight, uh, Washington was celebrated as a hero. George Washington was celebrated as a hero, and his army doubled in size. It went from 2,500 to 5,000 people enlisted. They wanted to be part of a good thing. Um, and uh, historians consider that this crossing of the Delaware and the two battles that happened on that same day uh, was the turning point in the American Revolution. The title for this presentation is Turning Point, and I'd like to have one more prayer. Lord Jesus, I'd like to ask for you to give us fresh insight into where we are, where we are. We're on planet Earth, but we weren't intended to stay here this way. There's something wrong going on, and you're planning to make it right. And we're excited that um, you are going to come riding out of the sky one day uh, to take your friends out of here Uh, Give us fresh insight and understanding and appreciation for what's ahead uh, so that we don't need to be afraid, but can be excited and rejoicing. In Jesus' name, amen. So there's a turning point coming in the great controversy battle as well. There's a turning point. The line of the tribe of Judah, that's Jesus, has been watching from the sidelines. Have you ever seen um, a cat that's stalking something, a mouse or a bird or whatever. The cat goes down low, kind of hunkers down tight to the ground on its stomach, its tail swishing back like this, you know. And then it does a couple little, little, you know, and its ears are going forward and its tail's going like that. And it does a couple more little things like that. It's sleeking down low on the ground. Well, in my mind, I'm picturing Jesus, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and he's in the tall grass off to the side. He's watching what's going on on earth. Because right now, the Bible says, as we end the close earth's history, the, the Satan is like a lion going about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That's what Satan's like. The Bible says that's what Satan's like. But there's another lion. And it's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he's watching. And I'm picturing, if it was Jesus, I'm picturing the tail switching. 
and the ears going forward. And he's watching. And Hosea tells us that he's going to come. He's going to, and we're going to follow the Lord, and he's going to roar like a lion. What I'm thinking now is all of a sudden he stands up in the tall grass. He puts his head, if you've ever been, have you, if you haven't been to a uh, game reserve where they have animals running in kind of in freedom, uh, maybe you've at least been to a zoo. And if you've ever been to a zoo when they're feeding the lions, they start to roar waiting for their food. And it doesn't matter where you are in the zoo, you can hear and feel the roar. A lion, when it roars, can cause your own stomach to tremble and vibrate. It's amazing how loud it is. And so in my mind, I see Jesus standing up. He's watching Satan at work, and he puts his head back as the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he roars. And Satan turns around and looks, and he says, Oh dear, this is not going to be a good day. <laughs> They're going to follow Jesus. Revelation 19, verses 11 and 12. <clears throat> I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse. The rider on the white horse is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. Now the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, also dressed in fine linen. Just a moment before we go to the next slide, I want to point something out. The entire army is dressed in white linen. What kind of army would go to war dressed in white linen? I mean, who camouflage, maybe, right? But white linen? What is this all about? You know, aren't they afraid they're going to get it dirty? No, they're not, because they're so victorious following the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. They're not even worried about soiled garments. They're not going to get dirty. But anyway, they, they're dressed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth, that's the leader, that's Jesus himself, out of his mouth comes a sharp sword, which is another way of saying his words are piercing. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written. And the name that is embroidered there says, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In the Bible, this is referred to as the last battle. It is sometimes referred to as the Battle of Armageddon. You may have heard those terms before. At this time, there's only two sides in the entire universe, just two sides. There's no middle ground anymore. The middle ground has disappeared. Last week, if you were here, we talked about the fact that there's a middle ground currently, but the middle ground is disappearing. When Jesus comes, there's only two groups, the hot and the cold. Right now, we have hot, cold, and lukewarm. Revelation 3, we talked about last week, lukewarm is kind of halfway between. They show up at church on the weekend, but they have virtually no time daily for Jesus going you know, day to day, week, week by week. Their, their, their spiritual life consists primarily of just going to church and praying before they eat food. Those are lukewarm people. The hot people are plugged into a vibrant, personal, meaningful relationship with Jesus on a daily basis. Well, anyway, at the very end, just two groups. The hot and the cold, the righteous and the unrighteous, the sheep and the goats, the wheat and the tares, the wicked and the holy. It's just, just two groups, just two sides. Uh, I have a little quotation I'm going to put on the screen. Two great opposing powers are revealed in this last great battle. On one side stands the creator of heaven and earth. All on his side bear his signet. They are obedient to his commands. On the other side stands the prince of darkness with those who have chosen apostasy and rebellion. Just two sides. You can summarize these two sides this way. Those who know God and those who don't know God. Now when I talk about knowing God, I'm not talking about knowing about God. I'm talking about knowing God. See, like right now, we have a president in the United States, sort of. And you, and, and you might read about him, and you might hear about him, but you don't know him. You know what he looks like. You know what he sounds like when he does talk. Um, you, 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 you're aware of these things, but if he was to show up in this town today, none of us would be invited to lunch with him because we don't know him and he doesn't know us. We know about him, but we don't know him. And the point I'm trying to make here is that at the end of time, the two groups, people who know Jesus, not just know about Jesus, they know Jesus and those who don't know Jesus. Now, in the group who don't know Jesus, there's a whole slew of people who know about him. But they don't know him. It's not enough to know about him. 
It's not enough to know the doctrines if I don't know the doctor. It's not enough to know the lowercase truths if I don't know the one who said I am the way, the truth, and the life. So at the end, just two groups. Just two groups. It is possible to be religious without being spiritual. We talked about that earlier in the week too, and we're not going to talk about it again. But before Jesus comes, a great shaking goes on, and the middle group goes one way or the other in the shaking time, in this settling time, in this sifting time. Everyone goes one way or another. <clears throat> this is happening in every denomination and outside of churches right now. And all you have to do is open one eye halfway and you can see that there's a great polarization going on in the world. A great polarization. Wickedness is becoming more and more in your face. Anybody here doesn't agree with that is not watching the news, is not attentive to what's going on. Just go into the stores. You know, things are different than they used to be. I mentioned this last week. I'm not going to take a lot of time to mention it again. But in more and more stores, um, you can't take stuff off the shelf. You have to get an attendant to unlock the cage so that you can get it because there's so much wickedness that shoplifting is rife. And stores, I told some of you last week, uh, in Everett, Washington, where our son lives, they actually had to shut the Walmart store completely down out of business because it could not sustain a profit while being ripped off constantly, the, 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 the loss was greater than the profit in the Walmart store. It was a super center, super center too. And the whole place shut down, just completely shut down. And Everett's a big, a big town, big city. Shut down. Why? Because crime is so in our face. I'll tell you one more thing and I'll get off this subject. In our little town of Walla Walla, where we live, where we live in the state of Washington, we're not traveling. It's just a little farm, farm town. It's not a big town at all. Uh, in the state of Washington, the rules are the governor of our country, our, our, of our state, has made rules uh, that the legislators are enforcing, and it's this: you can steal up to three thousand two hundred dollars from a store without being prosecuted or, or apprehended. So, uh, at the Home Depot where we are in the state of Washington, I've talked to the employees there. They say, "Yeah, yeah, people just they they, they tabulate. They come in with calculators." And they tabulate the cost of what they're putting in their shopping cart. And when they get to $3,000, they just walk out to their car with it. And nobody stops them because our government tells us we can't apprehend them. Because we're so free thinking and so liberal that we don't prosecute thieves. I'm saying that the polarization is going on right now. What I'm trying to say is the two groups are becoming more and more obvious. The Christians are becoming more and more obvious, and the, the wicked are becoming more and more obvious. And I think it's exciting, actually. It's exciting because it's the last thing that happens before Jesus comes. And so instead of going, oh, this is horrible, where we're living, it's, it's almost like, yes, Jesus, all right then, bring it on. Now, here's something that's going to happen. We're told that as these events begin to become more and more obvious, which is what they're doing, um, the final movements, God turns up the heat, so to speak, and the final movements will be rapid ones. Now, all you have to do is think about pre-pandemic versus pandemic. The entire planet was brought to its knees in two weeks. Commerce was shut down. Businesses were shut down. Churches were shut down. Uh, borders were shut down, airports were shut down, all in two weeks. Boom! I'd call that rapid. So we already now know that it's possible for the world to make radical shifts in two weeks or less. It's going to get worse than what we saw. That was just the dry run. That was just sort of the test run. That was just, it's going to get worse. And when it does, the final movements will begin happening with rapid suggest succession. And you know what? Something's going to be very interesting. People who studied the doctrines without getting to know the doctor. You follow what I mean by that? They don't know Jesus as a friend. They're not spending time with him daily. They don't, they don't read about him and commune with him in his word and talk with him in prayer. They just show up in church and pray before them. They've heard the doctrines, but they don't know the doctor. And at this point, what's going to happen is they're going to start seeing things happen that were prophesied in Scripture at the end of time. And they're going to say, oh, my word. 
it looks like we're really in the final events. I better get my act together because he's just around the corner. And Amos 8, well, they're going to try and catch the last, last trolley. What's they're going to do? They're going to try and ca- ca- catch the last trolley out. Uh, Marge and I, we, we like to go to the national parks. Uh, in Yosemite National Park and in Zion National Park, uh, I'm sure this is true in many other national parks, but in those two that we go to, they have free shuttle services. They have like these trams that are kind of like trains that have more than one connection to them and they go through. Um, and, they, and they have stops all throughout the scenic wonders of the, of the, of the um, national park. And at every one of the stops the trains and tro- that the tram- trams and trolleys stop at, there is a sign and it says, here's the last time in the day when this trolley will be serviced, when this station will be serviced. So, And then the sign says, do not get caught flat-footed. Do not get caught. Time your travels in the park so that you're back at your campsite before the last trolleys come through. And they post the time. And on more than one occasion, Margie and I have been on a tram that was headed back to drop us off. And as we come to a trolley stop, here's all kinds of people by the sign, all kinds of people. Our tram is completely full of people. People are standing in the center and all the chairs are taken. And the the bus stops. And then the driver speaks over a public address system that's broadcast outside the bus and says, I'm sorry. As you can see, we have no more room. Uh, good luck on your walk back to your campground. And he's the last tram, and there he goes, and we've seen it happen many times. Yeah, yeah. Why? Because people keep thinking, well, we still have a little more time. We still have a little more time. Let's go see this one more thing. Let's go get this one more photograph. Let's get a selfie of ourselves over here. Let's do this. Let's do that. Okay, now it's time. We better catch the tram. Oh, no more room. Did it happen to us once, too? Oh, that makes us look like fools. Oh. Yeah. And, and when it happens, uh, when you're on the tram in Zion, it actually, they, there's a public, there's a, there's a recorded message that comes over the PA system and it says, you know, don't do it, warns you about this. And then the last thing the public, the, 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 the recorded message says is, if you happen to be as far out as the farthest uh, stops, it can, it, it can be as much as five miles for you to walk in the dark to get back to the campground. So there's going to be a group of people, a large group of people, who are going to try and catch the last trolley out. Spiritually speaking, these are people who've been religious, but they haven't been spiritual. They have known about Jesus, but they haven't taken the time to cultivate and nurture and develop and maintain a personal friendship with Jesus day by day. And when they see the final events start to go in rapid succession, they say, we better get serious because we don't want to get left behind. Notice what Amos has to say about that. He says, men, and that's just referring to humanity now, men will wander everywhere from sea to sea, seeking the word of the Lord, searching, running here and going there, but they will not find it. Beautiful girls and fine young men alike will grow faint and weary, thirsting for the word of God. They realize there's a vacancy in their heart. They realize that even though they knew about Jesus, they had not invited him into their heart morning by morning and day by day, and they're empty and they start trying to find him now because they see what's going on. Well, what's their motive? If you think about it, they're being motivated by fear. And out of fear, they think they want Jesus. But there's going to come a time when if you've waited too long, you don't get on. It's not like you can say, well, I'll just catch the last trolley out. There is not going to be a last trolley out. These final groups are forming right now, and I believe we have almost reached the turning point. Almost. I don't know how soon we're going to get it, but I believe we've almost reached the turning point. I believe the line of the tribe of Judah is about to roar. Hebrews 10, 37 says, In just a very little while, he who is coming will come, and he will not delay. He's coming. He's coming. The battle of Armageddon is soon to be fought, and all the world is going to be on one side or the other of the question. We read a few moments about it ago about it in Revelation 19. This mighty conqueror is going to come riding forth, and he's not going to be a man of sorrows this time. When Jesus came the first time, he was known as a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, but that's not how he's coming the second time. He'll be leading the armies of heaven on a white horse, 
He will stand at the head of the angels. He will direct the battle. And who is this conqueror on the white horse? It's the same one who's fulfilling his promise in John 14, 1 to 3, when he said, I'm going to go prepare a place for you, and I'm going to come back and get you. That's who's on the white horse. Revelation 19, verse 11 says, He is faithful and true. He keeps his promise. He's not going to leave us. He said he's coming back for us, and he is going to come back. He's going to come back to deliver his own. Verse 12 of Revelation 19 had said that he had a name on him that no one knew except he himself. And that name has to do with being an avenger. Up until this time, Jesus has been the the, the lamb of God. Meek and mild, soft and woolly, cuddly and warm. But he comes back now as the avenger. He comes back to make old, bad, wrong things right. Um, I don't know if you've heard of a guy named Andrew Peterson. Um, he's a Christian musician, on, and, and you, if you haven't, uh, you might want to look him up on YouTube and listen to some of his stuff. It's pretty good. But he has a song called Rise Up. And on that song, there's a really, these lyrics. This is what I think is going to be about to start happening. He says, Every stone that makes you stumble and cuts you when you fall. Every serpent here that strikes your heel to curse you when you crawl. The king of love one day will crush them all. And every sad seduction and every clever lie, every word that woos and wounds the pilgrim children of the sky, the king of love will break them by and by. And you will rise up in the end. You will rise up in the end. I know the night is cruel, but the day is coming soon when you will rise up in the end. If a thief had come to plunder when the children were alone, if he ravaged every daughter and murdered every son, would not the father see this? Would not his anger burn? Would he not repay that tyrant in the day of his return? Await, await the day of his return, because you will rise up in the end. He will rise up in the end. I know you need a savior. He is patient in his anger, but he will rise up in the end. And when the stars come crashing to the sea, when the high and mighty fall down on their knees, we'll see the sun, S-O-N, descending in the sky. The chains of death will fall around our feet and we will rise up in the end. You will rise up in the end. He will rise up in the end. I know you will. That's what's happening. He's coming and he's coming as avenger. He's going to make the old thing right. He's basically saying, Satan, your 15 minutes is up. We're changing this now. You've had your time, and it hasn't gone well. You've proved to the entire onlooking universe you're a loser, and those who follow you are self-destructing. So we're going to set everything right. He's still the Word of God, and he's still carrying out the will of the Father. Earlier, he'd been on a a mission of mercy. Now he's on a mission of judgment. But the judgment doesn't affect or impact his friends. It uh, impacts those who have been either neglecting him or outright adversarial. Uh, It said that on his thigh was embroidered the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Do you remember when he came out of Joseph's tomb? You've read in the scripture on Sunday morning. He came out of Joseph's tomb. I wish I could see it. In my mind, I I picture the, the stone. You know, remember the angels roll the stone? The two angels come down in the darkness. It's not anywhere close to sunrise. So the, you know, the Easter sunrise service, well, that's nice and everything. But it, this is before sunrise that he comes out of the tomb. It's dark. And there are the, 100 Roman guard stationed around the tomb. And suddenly through the night sky comes two angels of glory, like comets that land on earth. Boom! Can you imagine being there and seeing that? And then one angel walks over to the stone that multiple soldiers had had to work together to leverage into place. One angel, as though it's just a piece of cotton, the angel goes, Phew! and the stone like just skips across out from under that angel's hand. And the other angel shouts into the opening of the sepulcher, Son of God, come forth, your father calls you. And Jesus steps out. Phew! And as he steps out, if you've ever seen a searchlight, a spotlight that searches in the sky, you've seen those, have you ever seen that before? Imagine if you were where that light is being projected, and you can see you can see it there on the ground where it's doing this, right? And if you were to look into it, it like blinds you, right? That'd be silly to do that. 
in my mind, as Jesus steps out of the tomb, it's like one of those searchlight <laughs> is shooting out from the opening of the hole into the tomb. And there's Jesus. And you know what he says? He says, all power has been given into my hands. All power. Whew. And it says that the entire uh, group of soldiers hit the ground like dead men. <laughs> Blinded by the light. Well, that's who's coming. The King of kings and Lord of lords who has all power given into his hand. Nobody's going to go up against him. Nobody's going to go up against him. He comes victor in heaven and earth. He comes to judge the living and the dead. We're told that the heavens are going to seem as though they are filled with radiant forms. So the sky is just going to be filled with hosts of angels, warriors who have come with him on his return. Human pins cannot betray the scene. You can't, you can't write it. Mortal minds cannot conceive the splendor. And there's no thorny crown on his head right now. We're told in Scripture that there's a diadem of glory on his head. In fact, it says this. It says he, had, he wears a crown within a crown within a crown. It's like a triple crown. <laughs> He's Lord of heaven and earth. This is not a thorn, thorny crown. It's a glorious diadem. And his face outshines the dazzling brightness of the noonday sun. His face. The king of kings descends on a cloud wrapped in flames of fire. The heavens are rolling together and closing again. I don't know what that means. Talks about it. The heavens roll together uh, like a scroll is what it says. They roll together like a scroll and unfold. It's like, you know, it's almost like Margie's going like curtains on a theater front stage. Like, woof, foom, woof, foom. And as this is going on, it goes back and forth from darkness to blazing glory. Darkness to blazing glory. Suddenly it's like a night sky and foom, there's the king of kings and all the cherubim serve him returning. They're, they're getting closer and closer and closer and closer. And woof, woof, woof. The earth's going nuts. The ground shakes, earth splits, islands are sinking into the ocean, entire island, Arizona becomes beachfront property as the entire west coast vanishes. It's going to be incredible. Psalms 50 verse 3 and 4 says, Our God's coming and He's not going to be silent. <laughs> A fire devours before him, and around him a tempest rages. He summons the heavens above and the earth that he may judge his people. Revelation 6 goes on like this. The king, then the, king of, the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and every free man hid in caves. This is not you guys, because friends of Jesus aren't going to be hiding. Friends of Jesus are going to be going, yes! But people who are not friends of Jesus, and, and sadly, they're in the majority. Sadly, they're in the majority. And those who are in the majority, who are not friends with Jesus, as he comes, the way we just described, they are going to be terrified, it says, and they're going to, every one of them is going to be trying to hide in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And that's not all. They call out, it continues, they call out to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us, kill us. Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of wrath has come and who can stand? I'll tell you who can stand. Everybody in this room. Who can stand? Everybody in this room. If you have been making Jesus a priority. You can stand. You don't have to worry. If you haven't been making him a priority, it's not too late. You can make him a priority. You can say, by God's grace, I am determined to spend time with Jesus daily, not in order to get through the end of time, but to become better acquainted with the best friend I could ever have. This is a good thing. This is not a scary thing. This is a privilege. This is an opportunity. This is not, you better do this. This is, you get to be friends with Jesus. You get to be friends. As he's coming, like we're describing here, scoffers and scorners cease their scoffing. Blaspheming lips are going to be hushed into silence. The clash of arms and tumult, the battle is stilled. There's nothing now heard around the circle of the globe except two sounds. One is the voice of prayer, and it's the friends of Jesus saying, This is our God. We've been waiting for him, and he's going to save us. Hallelujah. They are voice of prayer. The other sound that's being heard around the circle of the globe is the sound of weeping and wailing as rebels meet him whom they have been despising and rejecting. 
We're not going to have a nativity scene on our White House lawn. No, no, no. We're not interested in having God we trust on our currency. No, no, no. We're not interested in prayer in the public schools. No, no, no. And all of a sudden, there he is. There he is. And they're going to be trembling. They're probably, well, I won't say some of the other things that just came into my mind. It's not going to be good. They're going to be saying mountains fall on us. Verse 12 of Revelation 19 says, No one escapes the notice of he who sees with eyes of fire. Now, you remember when he was being crucified on Calvary? His murderers uh, were angry when Pilate had a sign put over the top of the cross that said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, and he had it written in three different languages. And the church leaders, they were angry. And they and they they told they told Pilate, take down that sign. We don't like that sign, King of the Jews. Now he's coming. It's not King of the Jews. It's King of the Universe who's coming. King of they didn't like the King of the Jews. They're certainly not going to like King of the Universe. King of the Universe. Right now they see his uh, robe embroidered, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. When they were looking at him on the cross, they mockingly said they'd believe if he would come down. Remember that. They come down off the cross. If you're who you say you are, come on down. We'll believe then. Well, he's coming down now. He's coming down, and they have no choice but to believe. Even though their belief isn't going to do them any good. The Bible says the devil believes, but the devil trembles. He believes. He knows who's coming. He knows what's coming. And it scares the daylights out of him. It scares the hell out of him. These people who have not chosen to become friends with Jesus while they had the opportunity now hear themselves saying something interesting. They hear themselves saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Everybody's going to say it. Even the people who didn't want him are going to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, the wicked who are saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, are not the only ones, the rank wicked aren't, wicked aren't the only ones who realize what's going on. I said earlier that there's going to be a large cross-section of people. In fact, I would even go so far, and this is scary, and I'm not going to take the time to substantiate my, my um, conclusion, but I'm going to, I believe that, that, that three-fourths of the average church membership is no longer going to be in the church. They'll have left before this happens. And this is going to be the hard part. They were there. But they left. These are the three fourths who were playing church. You know, when they were little, they played house. As they got older, they played church. They went to church. They showed up for a little while. They did the little praise God thing, and then they were, and then they had no more time for Jesus for the rest of the week. That's three fourths of most churches, of all denominations. I'm not talking about just my denomination. All denominations, and so they're going to be in the group that are going to be left behind, right? And here's the part that's going to be weird. They're going to know that what's happening is what they had understood before they left. They're going to know it. They're going to know it. They're going to go, oh, this is exactly the what, what, we, what we were taught. This is exactly what we studied. This is exactly what we, what we learned. And they're going to... Um, Well, let me, Margie, I'm going to skip through two slides, I think. No, no, I guess this is the one. All right, so let's go back. Okay, as they hear the voice of God, as they hear the voice of Jesus, these are people who had been in church but not in love with Christ. And that voice, when they hear his voice as he speaks now from the, from the glory and the, and, the, and the tumult, that voice they know. How often have its tender tones called them to repentance? How often has it been heard in the touching entreaties of a friend, a brother, a redeemer? The rejectors of his grace, those people who had had the opportunity to draw closer to him, who had been in the fellowship of the church family but hadn't gone serious about seeking Jesus, the rejectors of his grace are going to recognize the voice which has so long pleaded with them. Turn, turn away from your evil ways. Why will you die? Says Jesus, I've called and you refused. I have stretched out my hand and no one regarded. Like that voice awakens memories which they would like to forget. Warnings that they have despised. Invitations they have refused. Privileges that they have slighted.
This is just sad for me to think about. Because at this point, these people, it's, it's history. There's no change. You don't, you don't say, okay, well, sign me up now. No. And they're going to go, so that's him. I've heard his voice for the last 30 years. I've heard him whispering to me, can we be friends? I've heard the invitations to fellowship with him. And I've kept saying, I'm going to do that one of these days. One of these days. One of these days I'll get more serious. One of these days. One of these days I'll turn from the things that I'm preoccupied right now with. One of these days, stuff that's going to rot or rust or burn is not going to take top priority for me. One of these days. But one of these days doesn't happen. One of these days is always, always one of these days, right? I think you've all heard the, the, uh, the, the experiment has been done, although they wouldn't get away with it now because of all the animal rights people. But if you take a frog and you have a boiling kettle of water and you throw a frog into a boiling kettle of water, the frog will jump out of that water instantly. <laughs> Not staying there, death in this place. But if you take the same frog and you put him in a kettle of cold water, he'll swim around. Then if you start turning up the temperature gradually, the frog will just keep swimming around. He'll keep swimming around until he dies. He won't jump out because the danger has been happening gradually. And because it's been happening gradually, it's almost imperceptible to him, but finally there comes a point where it's too late. You can't resuscitate the frog. Same thing's happening on planet Earth. The signs that we have and the invitations that Jesus has been giving to fellowship and a friendship with him, they've been coming. But people who have not been paying attention to it, who think someday I'll get serious, are going to discover that one day you can't get resuscitated because you waited so long that your heart can't respond. It's sad. It's just sad. And Jesus is calling to us now, hop out of the pot. Hop out into the arms of Jesus. Uh, I have a little slide here. Margie had this up earlier. But the way we hop out is by taking time for him day by day. That's a picture of what we call the relationship with Jesus stool. It's a three-legged stool representing a personal relationship with Jesus. And the three legs are what support, nurture, grow, and maintain a relationship with Jesus. The first one is Bible study for the purpose of getting to know Jesus. Not Bible study to prove doctrine. Not Bible study to get the theological ducks lined up in a row. Not Bible study to show one church that this church is better than that church. Not that kind of Bible study. No, this is Bible study, food for my soul. This is getting to know Jesus is my friend. I'm looking for him. That's the kind of Bible study we're talking about. The second leg of the stool that supports relationship with Jesus, and this is a daily thing, is prayer. And this is not prayer to get answers. This is not prayer to claim promises. This is not prayer for 911 emergency help. This is prayer for communication with Jesus as friend with friend because the number one ingredient in all relationships is communication. Whether it's human or God, it's communication. So that's the second leg of the relationship with Jesus stool. And the third leg of the stool that supports and nurtures a relationship with Jesus day by day is talking with other people about how cool it is to be friends with Jesus. So as you become more excited about him through legs one and two, time with him in legs one and two, you spill over to these friends about this friend. And as you spill over, it creates more room for you to receive more of the water of life, which keeps you from growing stagnant. This is a relationship with Jesus stool. And this is how we hop out of the pot. So when Jesus says, hop out of the pot, this is the launching pad. This three-legged stool is the launching pad. He's coming for his friends, and friends talk. Now I have another quotation I want to put on the screen. The restraining spirit of God is even now being withdrawn from the world. If you don't believe that, you haven't been paying attention to news. Around the planet, things are going nuts. The environmentalists want us to believe it's because of global warming and because we have been using too much combustion and fuel and so we're destroying the atmosphere and we're responsible for the mess and so we've got to clean up the mess. The truth is the restraining protection of God is being withdrawn from the earth. That's what's actually happening. This is not environmental protection. This is the restraining power of God is stepping. Now, why is he stepping back? Very simply because he's been told he's not welcome here. And he's not a gentleman. I mean, excuse me, he's not a, he's not a, um, he is a gentleman and he doesn't force himself for he's not welcome. That's why if you've ever, ever seen pictures that people paint of Jesus knocking at the heart store, he's always knocking. And if you ever look carefully at the doors, there are no knobs 
on the front side of the door. The Jesus is on no knobs. And the reason is because the artists understand Jesus won't open the door himself. He won't kick it in. He won't force an entry. We open the door. We say, please do come in. I do want to spend time with you. I am when I sit on that three-legged stool. I do want to spend time with you. And as we invite him in, that's how the friendship, the relationship, and the saving relationship develops and grows. Anyway, <clears throat> So the restraining spirit of God is even now being withdrawn from the world. It's because we have told him unilaterally around the world, you're not welcome here. So he pulls back. Hurricanes, storms, tempests, fires and floods, disasters by sea and land are following each other in quick succession. Before you go on to the next slide, Margie, I was sitting in a doctor's office waiting to be seen. And I, I picked up a Newsweek magazine that was sitting on a, on a table in front of the chair. The cover of the Newsweek magazine said these words. Are natural disasters increasing? That was the headline cover article of Newsweek. Are natural disasters increasing? What well, kind of caught my attention? So I picked up the magazine, started looking for the featured article, front page, and it started out by saying this. Are there more natural disasters going on in the world currently? Or do we just think there are more because, because of the internet, the globe is united digitally, and we hear about things now more often than we would have prior. So if there's an earthquake in China, we know about it 15 seconds after everybody else knows about it. And so, it's the, so the Newsweek is basically saying, are there more of these things, or do we just are we more aware of it? I was fascinated to read the article. They actually did an in-depth historical using scientific data that ever since it's been recorded, Using scientific data and records, they did a study on the history of natural disaster, and they said that natural disasters on planet Earth are 100 times greater and more frequent than they were 200 years ago. 100 times more frequent. This was in Newsweek. This wasn't in a Bible. This was in Newsweek. 100 times more frequent than they were 200 years ago. 100 times. This isn't just we're more aware of it. There's more of them. There's more earthquakes. There's more fires. There's more hurricanes. There's more typhoons. There's more tornadoes. There's more droughts. There's more. There's more. Hail. There's more. There's more. They're happening in quick succession. Now we continue with this next slide. Science tries to explain it. Oh, it's global warming, they say. We're just destroying the earth because we, have, we need to all have Teslas. That'll save the world, even though it will break your pocketbook. Science seeks to explain all of these. But the signs thickening around us are telling us of the near approach of the Son of God. They are attributed to any other but the true cause. So it's not global warming. It's the angels of heaven have been told, do you know this? If it weren't for the divine intercession and protection of God, Satan would even destroy the birds. Satan would decimate the planet. He would take out all the animals too. He just, he's just ruthless. He's a fiend. His only satisfaction is destruction. And it's the intervention and protection of heaven that keeps the planet from just combusting. So as heaven starts backing off, the devil just rushes in. And then, of course, the devil wants us to say that that's God. You know, insurance agents, they call it acts of God when a hurricane comes through. The devil wants you to think that's God. God did that. No, God didn't do that. What happened was Satan did that because God stepped back. And why did God step back? He stepped back because he was told, get out of here. So he said, okay. Sorry for you, but okay. The signs thickening are telling us of the approach of the Son of God. They're attributed to anything other than their true cause. It continues. Men cannot discern the sentinel angels restraining the four winds. They can't see that. That's what's been, that's what's been going on. But it continues again. But when God shall bid his angels loose the winds, step back, give them what they're asking for, there will be such a scene of strife as no pen can picture. Such a stream of sun, no pinch can picture. 
The war is about to turn. Pardon me? Oh, the sign. Yeah, this is kind of a cool sign if you haven't seen that one. Um, there was a period of about 10 years where people, I don't know who was the agencies responsible for it, but they were putting up signs that were kind of get people back to God. All kinds of them. This was one of them was, was God. We need to talk. God, you know. Um, anyway, this was a, a hurricane came through Florida. Did multi-billions dollars of damage. And I wish I had the photograph that had been taken for more of an aerial view of the sign because you'd see all of the surrounding areas just decimated. It just looks like a war zone that's been bombed. Okay, and so what had been the cover of this billboard got ripped off in the hurricane and the previous sign before had said, we need to talk. <laughs> we need to talk. You know what? I think of it this way. We need to talk not from the perspective of God saying, all right, have you had enough yet? No, what I see it is God saying, can we be friends? Could we talk? Could we have a relationship. Could I knock on your heart and you open it? Could we talk? That's the kind of thing I'm thinking. Could we talk? We need to talk. Let's talk. Let's do breakfast. I'll bring the bread of life. Let's do breakfast. The war is about to turn unmistakably in favor of the Lord's side. The terms of engagement are going to change. A white horse is going to come thundering out of heaven and there'll be no mistaking the rider on that horse. And that's how it's going to end for those who have refused to accept his invitation of friendship. That's how it's going to end for them. But that's how it's going to begin for those who have said yes to him day by day. Listen to Buddy Ho telling song. Mr. Weatherman, there by your lap I see you stand, and you let me know, will it rain or snow, but I want to know much more, see I'm watching for my Lord, is he on his way, what's your radar say, I've been hearing all the forecasts, the world is on a downhill slide And to know the only answer Is coming in the eastern sky When one of those clouds is full of angels More than a million strong One of those clouds is bringing Jesus I've waited oh so long Every eye is going to see Him All will hear the trumpet blow Mr. Weatherman, do you understand that that cloud means it's time to go home? Meteorologist, my Jesus has left a list of things that will come to pass. It's going fast. Meteorologist. So many times I wish that it could be tonight Check your satellite Lots of people want it sunny But I'm okay with overcast Cause I know that when we see that cloud We're going home at last When one of those clouds is full of angels More than a million strong one of those clouds is bringing Jesus I've waited oh so long Every eye is going to see Him All will hear the trumpet blow Mr. Weatherman, do you understand That that cloud means It's time to go home Hey now, Mr. Weatherman Do you understand whether it is today or tomorrow, whether it's day or night, whether or not you choose to believe it, he's making all things, he's making all things right. But one of those clouds is full of angels, 
more than a million strong. One of those clouds is bringing Jesus. I've waited oh so long. Every eye is gonna see him. All will hear the trumpet blow. Mr. Weatherman, do you understand that that cloud beats? It's time to go home. Now, Mr. Weatherman. It's time to go home. Now, Mr. Weatherman. Can you see the plan? Do you understand? On his album, not on this thing, a voice comes on right here and says, now here's Dan with a weather report for tomorrow. Dan? And then Dan says, small cloud coming from the east. Looks like it's going to be a great day. <laughs> Let's have prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the things that are going on on our planet right now. I mean, they're, they're scary. They're crazy. They're wild. They're destructive. They're, they're just, it's not good. But we're glad that the world is waxing old like a garment because that means you're going to come and fix it all up again. And so we're excited about that. And we're also excited that while we wait for you to return, we don't have to wait to see you. We can spend time with you morning by morning, day by day. All we have to do is open up our Bibles. All we have to do is look in the Gospels and read the stories about you and your interaction with people to be reminded of who you are and what kind of a friend you are and how that's still true today. And so I just pray that each one of us will jump out of the hot water into your arms and we'll sit on that three-legged stool so that when we do see you coming in the clouds, we'll be among the ones who say, yes, this is our Lord. We've been waiting for him and he will save us. That's my prayer for myself and everybody in here. In Jesus' name, amen.